now in New England, it's about five degrees below zero Fahrenheit. And that's just too brutal. And so with that in mind, we're going to wait a little bit on this. And in the meantime, I'm going to do a video on some rather amazing speakers that I just built. And it started with a couple of weeks ago, the work that we were doing with the active uh, sound reduction began playing around with these little Dayton $6 audio exciters. And when I attached these things to some trash, literally trash, and played music through them, I was stunned. The quality of the music that came out of this was not at all like a $6 speaker. It sounded like a decent bookshelf speaker. So I went to the Parts Express website where they have a um, project gallery. And a guy named Rich did a really nice write-up on what are called DML, or distributed mode loudspeakers, and went through the whole process of uh, sizing them, building them, constructing them, and at the end has a couple of very sexy looking speakers mounted on a pair of artist's easels in his living room. And based on everything that I've learned subsequently, I believe him when he says that they sound really nice. You go on YouTube, you see another couple of examples of people doing this, and so we just couldn't leave that alone. So like everything that we do here, we began a rather deep investigation to see just how good we could make speakers using this technology. Now if you remember in the acoustics video we did a couple of weeks ago, I was talking about the importance of phase relationships. And in a typical listening room, when you have two speakers on opposite sides of the room, and you're sitting in between them, both speakers are working together in concert, so to speak and it produces a very nice sound. But what happens is you move laterally from the room, you can envision a triangle that's formed by between the two speakers in my head. It's becoming distorted, and as I move closer to one speaker versus the other speaker, the distance from this speaker is becoming longer, this one shorter. Eventually, I reach a point where the distance between, the differential distance is one half wavelength of a particular frequency. And at that point, you're in a node. You get almost no amplification, almost no sound. And as you continue to move laterally, you'll reach another point where you're one and a half wavelengths lateral to the center spot. As you move across the room, you're going to get these peaks and these troughs of sound amplitude. And that really creates regions in the room where it's not very good to listen to the sound. In addition to these, in addition, these speakers, because of their conical shape or their spherical shape, act a little bit like shaped uh, anti-tank charges. They focus the sound in front of them. So when you include the focusing property of the speakers and the phasing property of the speakers, you get a lot of regionality in the room. And even if you're using, say, ribbon speakers or electrostatic speakers, which don't suffer from the, the shape factor, you nevertheless are always going to be suffering with a, a phasing factor. And that's why these speakers here, which are based on a distributed panel, have a really unusual, rather unique property of very little amplitude variation within a room because the sound that you're hearing, instead of coming from a very small discrete source, is coming from the entire panel. And it's interesting, if you sit in a very high quality listening room and you're listening to very good quality speakers, you might say, man, that sounds really good, but you can usually still always tell that the sound the vocalist is coming from, say, that box in the corner, there's a localization. But when you come into a room with these larger panel speakers, it's a lot more like putting on a high quality pair of headphones. You still get left and right separation, but you don't have that vocalization. It's, maybe it takes a little bit of getting used to. You may not like the feeling of the sound uh, from headphones, but that's more a matter of taste. It's not so much a matter of quality. And personally, I like it more. One of the things that the manufacturer recommended when building the speakers is to use a material that has a very high compression strength, but a very low bending strength. In other words, it's very flexible and bending, but very stiff in compression. Compression makes sense. You're not going to couple a lot of energy from a little module like this when it's attached to foam. So you want something with high compression strength, but you also want something that's going to be able to flex and bend and vibrate in order to produce the sound. The property of both being stiff and flexible is really something that you usually don't get in a single material. With the exception of the end grain balsa, every material that I tested and every material that I could locate 
has those sort of properties not working in conjunction with each other. I decided to ignore the recommendation of the manufacturer and test a huge variety of materials to just find out what would be the best materials. And so I attached these actuators to plates of steel, glass, aluminum, brass, polycarbonate, acrylic, pine, oak, resin and spruce. I attached them to fiberglass. I attached them to gypsum or drywall. I also attached them to structured materials like plywood, both the cheap fur stuff from the big box stores, as well as the higher quality marine plywoods like Moranti and Acuna. I also attached them to balsa wood, like I talked about there, as well as uh, materials like cardboard, a plastic variation on cardboard, uh, I believe it's called Corla, and to Nomex carbon fiber honeycomb, I've attached them to sandwiches of uh, fi um, carbon fiber and urethane, as well as to polyethylene, polyurethane, and polystyrene foam, uh, both the extruded and the expanded. The expanded is lousy, the little white beads fall all over and you can't get the actuators to stick to them. The very best materials turn out to be resonant spruce, which is the same material that they use to make uh, guitars and piano sound boards. And there's actually a company in Eastern Europe that builds speakers, expensive speakers, very much like these, using resonant spruce. End grain balsa is excellent. The extruded polystyrene is excellent. As well as what's called pallet board, or it's a type of cardboard that has a hexagonal inner mesh as opposed to the sort of wobbly type of uh, inner corrugation like you see on the boxes. The polystyrene was the very best and produced very good quality sound, but tended to have more amplitude and higher frequencies. The end grain balsa, again, excellent but tended to be a richer sound, produced more amplitude in the lower frequencies. The cardboard was almost as good as these two materials, but covered the same, covered the entire range in one material. And finally, the resin spruce was just about as good as the cardboard. However, you want the largest panels, as we discuss, that you could possibly afford, and building large panels out of expensive soundboard, it could be prohibitive. So, what we did, once we discovered what the materials were, is we started testing the different panels. And in order to do that, I hooked them up to a computer as well as an amplifier. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to demonstrate how these panels actually work in real life. Something I want to show you before we begin the test is that I have the computer set up with the equalizer absolutely flat across the middle. We're not cheating here, and we're producing as accurate a reproduction of the sound as the speaker can. The first panel that we're going to hook up is going to be the worst example of the solid materials. All of the solid materials tend to have a ringing component to them. They tend to vibrate, and what that does is it muddies the sound. So the first speaker that we're going to hook up here is going to be that plate of aluminum over there. And so when you hear this, take a listen not only to the sound, but take a listen to the sound after the second plays. Hear that ringing? That's the problem with the solid materials. And as a result, you don't want to use any of them. The better material that uh, I've identified, which is the extruded polystyrene, is very good at reducing the high frequencies, but because it has damping, it doesn't ring. And so the notes, the sound peaks, don't run into each other, and you get very crisp separation. The manufacturer also recommends rounding the corners and easing the edges. What this does is it helps to reduce some of the resonant peaks that you get in these panels, and we're going to discuss that a little bit later. They also recommend doing something to the surface of the panel, which is to sand it. When they make extruded polystyrene,